Everyone, I'm Jamie Monson. I'm the director of the African Studies Center here at Michigan State University. And it's a wonderful pleasure to welcome everyone. This is our first Eye on Africa Speakers series talk uh, of the year. And it's an especially important occasion for me to welcome Dr. Shuni Hartwig, who I've known for many, many years. <laughs> And I thought I would, by way of introducing her, tell you a little bit of my own autobiography because we're talking about life stories and storytelling. So I think of, of Dr. Charlotte Hartwig, we always call her Shuni. And I, I met Shuni in 1991 when I was teaching at St. Olaf College and also at Carleton College. And Shuni's life, in my way of thinking, has three big phases in terms of big parts of her life that I know about. And I came into the middle, phase two, when Shuni was in the middle of what I consider to be the premier model of an education abroad program between an American college and African institutions. So Shuni had founded a program that ran for 33 years for a consortium of American colleges. And it wasn't a study abroad program for American students to go to Africa and learn something and come back. It was an exchange program. American students went to Tanzania, and part of their program was to fund African partners to come back and come to the Lutheran colleges of Tan of, in the United States. So I think it was for every one American student uh, was that every two American students could fund one. But at any rate, Shuni, long before partnership became possible, it's something we all talk about today, this was really an ethical foundation that was critically important to the creation of this, of this program. Many of those Tanzanian fellows went on to become PhD professors at universities in Tanzania. And one of them that was there when I was there is now the vice chancellor of the University of Dar es Salaam. So in addition to bringing knowledge about Africa, African experience to American students, Shuni was critically important to building capacity in higher education in Tanzania. And then the next phase of Shuni's life was building a similar partnership for K through 12 education in Tanzania. Her program, Education for Partnership, and not like we say partnership for education, but Education for Partnership, seeing that education and partnership need to go together. Very visionary program, still going today. What we all dream of, Shuni has retired, handed it over, and it's flourishing on its own. So really, again, a, a model for us. I just wanted to mention those two things because partnership is something we're doing um, and we can all learn from Shuni. But today, Shuni's gonna take us back to the first phase where I wasn't there and it's all new and very, very important part of her life when she got to know this very, very um, significant African intellectual and writer. And that's what she's gonna talk about today. And this connects to one other piece of what we do at MSU, which is we're finding ways to partner in preserving historical materials, including literature and language, and making it available in new formats through um, digital formats like, like we do at Matrix and so on. So once again, uh, all the phases of Shuni's life intersect with what we hope to do at MSU. So we're very fortunate that you're here um, to teach us. We are very delighted that you're going to be talking about your new uh, biography project. So warmly welcome, Shuni. Thank you so much. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah, 60 years ago, when I was in my early 20s, my eyes were not on Africa <laughs> at all. In fact, actually, they were focused on my 
two small boys who at that point were 20 months and four months old and my teaching husband and living in Boston, Massachusetts. So when Jerry came home from school one day with this flyer announcing Teachers for East Africa program out of Columbia University, I'm looking at it and I'm saying, you've got to be kidding. Where is this? I mean, you know, I didn't even know where on the map it would be. He says, well, Tanganyika, Kenya, and Uganda are newly independent countries. They need English-speaking teachers, and we'd both qualify. Well, I soon learned rather quickly to say, you've got to be kidding, because within a year, we had moved to Arusha, Tanganyika with our children and um, were teaching at Ilboro Secondary School. And I have to admit, my eyes have been on Africa ever since. Um, Thank you so much, Jamie, for this invitation because it's an inauguration, if you will, of the biography of Anaceti Kitareza uh, that hopefully will extend to the printed word. As you will hear, Kitareza's novel, Myombakeri and Buganoka, was first published in Kiswahili in 1981. The English, German, and French translations are also available. So why is this important? What is there in Kitareza's novel and his life that makes this combined saga so extraordinary. To put Kitareza's novel in an African literature perspective, I will excerpt from Professor Joseph Mbele's introduction to the bi biography, and thus you will first hear how his novel, completed in 1945, is a global literary marker. And so I quote from Professor Mbele. For a proper appreciation of Kitareza, we should place him within an historical perspective in order to underline the fact that he is part of a long-standing tradition. The origin and evolution of this tradition is intimately tied up with the history of Africa itself. Africa is the cradle of the human race and thereby of language and storytelling. Language as the principal means of self-expression and communication was also the principal vehicle of storytelling. Since language originated and evolved as an oral phenomenon, storytelling or literature started as an oral tradition and remains such for millennia. For this reason, we do not have records of the earliest stories, songs, and other forms of verbal art. However, the invention of writing made possible the textualization of oral literature and the creation of literature as a written tradition. We do have evidence of these developments from ancient Egypt, where the hieroglyphic script created about 5,000 years ago was used to produce documents of various kinds, such as records of oral traditions and religious doctrines. There are other people in ancient Africa who developed writing traditions, such as the Libyans and the Ethiopians. The Ethiopians created the Getz script that they used to record various traditions, including religious teachings. With the spread of Islam, the Arabic script was introduced in Northern Africa, the Maghreb, the Sahel, and the East African coast and adjacent islands. Writing an Arabic script evolved. In the Hausa and Swahili areas, the Arabic script was modified to suit the ling linguistic features of these languages and was used to write in various genres such as historical chronicles and poetry. Poetry was the mainstay of Swahili creative writing from the very beginning, perhaps before the 18th century. Prose came later in the Swahili tradition. The first prose work we know is Tipu Tip's biographical narrative, Maisha Yatip, published in the late 19th century. With the coming of European missionaries and colonial rule, literacy in European languages was introduced, mostly English, French, and Portuguese. In the colonial schools and mission stations, Africans read European works of literature, some translated into African languages. A typical example was Pilgrim's Progress. These together with translations of the Bible fostered the kind of competence of written in African languages that made it possible for a cadre of indigenous writers to emerge. That is how literature evolved in languages such as Xhosa, Zulu, Soto, Shona, Yoruba, and Kikuyu. In East Africa, this pattern was replicated. Colonial and mission schools fostered literacy in, indig in indigenous languages such as Swahili, Ganda, and Kikuyu. A cadre of indigenous writers emerged in these languages. Under the tutelage of the Europeans, these writers tended to promote perspectives acceptable to their mentors. James Mbotela of Tanganyika wrote Uhuru wa Watumwa, which concerned the slave trade and the eventual rescue and rehabilitation of slaves by missionaries. It was the kind of vision presented earlier in Thomas Mofolo's Moetiwa Bochabela. 
However, there was also a deep commitment on the part of many of these early African writers to record African traditions, with the result that the creative writings of many of these early writers appropriated traditional folklore. Classic examples are Dio Faunwa and Amos Tutuola writing Gakarawa Jao in Kikuyu and Thomas Motfolo in Sesotho. If we take our cue from Kitareza, it seems necessary to pay attention to his particular historical background. It's necessary to acknowledge he did not emerge and operate in a vacuum, but that he inherited, participated in, and sought to preserve the age-old traditions and his cultural heritages as they existed on Ukrewe. Born under German colonialism, receiving his education in mission schools, he witnessed the encroachment of European culture on his society. He benefited from the system by becoming conversant in several languages. Despite all this, however, he did not set out to glorify the influence of Europeans, as did many African writers. Kitareza wanted to preserve the traditions of his people for all generations. In this, he was driven by the same motives that impelled Elias Landroth of Finland to record the traditional songs of his people, which he synthesized and presented in the form of the Kalevala epic, so central to the identity of the Finnish people. The same motive drove Chinua Achebe to write Things Fall Apart as a response to European writings about traditional Africa that he disliked because they did not present a truthful image. Other African writers writing within the European colonial and missionary environment appropriated European writings such as Pilgrim's Progress and Christian teachings. They judged African traditions as negative and looked to Europeans as agents of the African civilization's redemption. Kitareza, remarkably, did not follow this trend. Though raised in the colonial and missionary environment, he sought to be the witness of African traditions. Although Kitareza's novel falls within the tradition of African written literature, it appropriates and is deeply rooted in Karebe oral tradition and folklore. He uses indigenous modes of storytelling and aesthetics. His novel, though a work of fiction, is a rich compendium of Karebe customs. Kitareza stated categorically that he sought to preserve those customs for posterity, and it is remarkable that his work does not bear the imprint of its colonial and missionary context. Indirectly, Kitareza's novel can be seen as an anti-colonial text in the sense that it refuses to acknowledge colonialism and instead celebrates the culture of the African people. In this way, his novel resembles Camarillet's The African Child, which in the midst of French colonialism in Guinea focuses on celebrating traditional life. Scholars of African literature dwell a great deal on the issue of writing in African languages, as well as the issue of translation of African language works. They talk about translating such works into not only European and other foreign languages, but also into other African languages. Kitareza offers another unique point of reference on both counts. Those who advocate the translation of African lit language literatures into African languages can see Kitareza as a model. He wrote his novel in his mother tongue, Kikrebe, and then translated it into Swahili. To those who think about translating African literature into non-African languages, Kitareza offers a case study as well, since his novel has been translated into three European languages. Now, Kitareza's biography, Anaceti Kitareza, a Tanzanian epic. It began with a big box in which Jerry had put all the collected publications, tapes, pictures, and letters from our year on Ukarewe, 1969 to 70, and the ensuing 10 years of correspondence between an editor from Heinemann's publishing company in Nairobi, Kenya, a Swahili translator in Arusha, Tanzania, Catholic priests from Ukarewe, a Boston supporter, and the Hartwigs in North Carolina. This epistolary saga is unique, for at stage center, are 87 blue airgrams written by Anasetti himself. You will hear his own voice and the others who were all dedicated to getting his novel published. So now it's my privilege to introduce you to this extraordinarily ordinary man, Anasetti Kitareza, a Tanzanian epic. What must we teach our children? One man's answer comes from a remote island in Lake Victoria 
where he realized that the wisdom of his people's folk tales, proverbs, and music texts held life-meaning guidance for future generations. The forces that gave him the passion to devote his life in pursuit of the answer are stories within a story. Stories of how words spoken became words written. Stories of inheritance teaching peaceful ways of living. Stories for everyone, everywhere. It's been noted that there is only one Homer and there's only one Shakespeare, for it was their classic epic writings that historically positioned Europe at the center of world literatures. Now we must travel south from Greece and Great Britain to the continent of Africa and the country of Tanzania, for it is there on the island of Ukurewe in Lake Victoria, Lake Victoria where we will discover there is only one Kitareza. Not only is his literary masterpiece, Miobakere Nabugunoka, the longest written novel from the continent of Africa, the story of the author, Anaceti Kitareza, is epic in his heroic and courageous life of eight decades. From an obscure island in Lake Victoria comes a tale within a tale, a story of a man in his writing that places Tanzania at the heart of Africa's epic world. During his lifespan from 1896 to 1981, Kitareza witnessed German and English rule, Catholic missionaries, and traders whose presence threatened traditional ways of living. Trained in a Catholic seminary, he became a teacher, a clerk, a translator, an ethnographer, a collector of folk tales and proverbs, and finally, a writer. At the center of Kitareza's writing is this question, what must we teach our children? What is the source of such a profound question? For a man who grew up only hearing stories, for a man who never owned a book other than a dictionary and a Bible? What caused him to write his own? What compelled him to write for children when none of his own lived beyond the age of four? This narrative of a living epic tells his story as well as his written answer to the question that is at the heart of his extraordinary, ordinary life. Kitareza's Once Upon a Time began in turmoil. 1896 was not a good year to be born. His father and mother had fled their island home on Ukurewe to the mainland of northeast Tanganyika, seeking refuge from German power struggles. You may wonder how this could be. What could this remote island in Lake Victoria possibly have that a European power wanted? Ukurewe's geographical position tells its own unique story. This once heavily timbered island is the largest in Lake Victoria, with a landmass 70 miles long and 10 miles wide. Due to reliable rainfall, Migrants from Tanganyika's mainland settled there, assured of crop harvesting sufficient to ward off famine. Kitareza's family was of the original Salanga Sese ruling clan. His grandfather was the king, or the Omokama. The other migrant groups, the Jita, Sukuma, and Kara, were subject to King Rukonge. They lived peacefully, farming beans and millet, herding cattle, hunting wildlife on land, and fishing or hunting hippos on the lake. A year before Kitareza's birth, the Germans arrived on the island to claim it as their own. In Europe, as the Industrial Revolution took hold, the need for additional minerals and materials caused European leaders to look for other resource areas. The Scramble for Africa meeting in Berlin in 1884 initiated the dividing of the continent with Tanganyika going to the Germans. Ostensibly, the reason for European takeovers was to bring civilization to illiterate peasants whose barbaric ways would be replaced with Western enlightenment. Missionaries would save them through Christianity. Schools would provide linguistic and educational tools to live well. And the Germans' anti-slavery society would provide the moral banner for German takeover to be known as German East Africa. The king soon realized that the German power structures could have a devastating impact upon his people. It was more than the denial of his authority. The basic tenets of their society were challenged. The Bakarebe identity in language, in cultural values, in their ways of knowing how to live well, was all at survival risk. Because of King Rukonge's resistance, the Germans deposed, exiled, and jailed him. As members of the royal family, Kitareza's mother and father fled with their newborn son to the mainland. However, within four years, his father died from smallpox. Kitareza and his mother then returned to Ukurewe to live within the king's compound. As the German foothold became entrenched on Ukurewe soil, cotton and rice were introduced as cash crops, 
and trees were felled for an increasing timber market. The Catholic Church joined the expatriate population in 1901 by sending French-Canadian priests to establish schools as part of their mission outreach. For the majority of the Bacarebe, this was ignored with a strong show of resistance. However, within the royal household, an interest in how these foreigners gained power had been ignited. Kitareza was sent to school to discover their secrets. At the age of nine, Kitareza began his own educational journey, one that would weave his education between the formal and the informal, between classroom study and evening firelight, firelight storytelling. An apt pupil, the Catholic priest suggested that he enter the seminary, a worthy candidate for the priesthood. Kitareza was 13 years old. He spent 10 years at Rubia Seminary, located on the mainland, mastering Latin, the language of Roman Catholic institutions. He learned Greek, a requirement of the seminary, and German, the language of the colonizers. He already knew Kiswahili, the African language of traders and merchants. And of course, he was proficient in Kikrebe, the language of his clan. More changes were ahead with the defeat of the Germans in World War I. As a result, German East Africa was divided into Rwanda and Burundi and given to the Belgians. And at the end of World War II in 1946, Tanganyika was given to the British as a protectorate. Kitareza then learned English. By now, he was a young adult male. Becoming a priest, however, meant celibacy. It meant giving up one of the primary identity markers of being Krebe, having children. He had already changed his first name to Anasetti, a requirement upon conversion to Catholicism, but not to marry. Soon after his de decision to leave the seminary, he married Anna Katura. He was now 23 years old. Given Kita Reyes's educational background, he found employ employment first with the Mwanza rice mill as a clerk and purchaser, and then with East African rice mills. However, with the outbreak of World War II, normal economic s development ceased, causing Kitareza and Anna to return to the Kagunguli mission on the island. And it was here that his writing genesis began. He was assigned to work with a French-Canadian priest, Father J. A. Samard, as a translator of religious materials. Father Samard recognized Kitareza's keen intellect. He encouraged him to begin collecting undocumented legacies of his own people, thus initiating a creative, ethnographic, and writing life to sustain him all his days. As Kitareza's documenting of folk tales, music texts, and proverbs grew to a significant collection, he became acutely aware of this treasure from his own people. He had lived through the changes on Ukrewe from outsiders. He had witnessed the erosion of his people's values. Within this ethnographic process came a new realization. If he didn't write about these cultural ways of the past, the Bakrebe inheritance would be lost. Kitareza's question then, what must we teach our children, became the heart of his epic saga. A folktale that illustrates this well from Kitareza's collection is a story about a white-faced monkey and a black-faced lizard who want to be friends. Their dilemma is not only differences in their physical appearance, but in their cultural norms. The leader or king of each group declares that they must become like us before a friendship is possible. On an island where at first glance everyone seems related, difference is profoundly hidden in language and marriage customs for starters. Yet there is another difference. Within the island and northeast Tanzanian populations, there is a significant albino presence. To this day, Witchcraft ideologies perpetuate the belief that their unusual skin tone has magical powers. Albino's lives are at risk. As you will hear, there is no direct answer to Kitareza's question as to what we should teach our children. However, the tale of Nkwambu Nkende raises the profound question of what is required if differences can be overcome so that we might live together peacefully. This dilemma tales, English adaptation lends itself well to theater mime as well as other venues. So here's Nkwambu and Nkende. I have a little story that I think you will like about a monkey who is black and a lizard who is white. Nkwambu the monkey was walking one day when he met Nkende the lizard and he stopped to say, listen my friend, come to my house and eat. I promise I'll fix you a very special treat. With delight, the lizard said, well, when will this be? And Nkwambu the monkey said, 
tomorrow I'm free. The monkey hurried home to tell his wife because they'd never fed a lizard in their entire life. The monkey said, lizards like intestines of a fish. His wife said, you really think that's a tasty dish? The monkey said, I'm off to see our chief, for I'm sure he'll agree to make our friend the lizard part of our family. When the lizard arrived the next day to dine, everything was prepared, especially fine. The chair, the table, everything was set, if only the chief's rules could be easily met. The monkey said, friend, I'm sure you'll agree good friends are just part of one big family. My chief says, you can become one of us if you'll eat in the chair without too much fuss. So the lizard tried, and he tried, and he tried some more. But he always landed on the floor, and sadly, he went home. Later that week, the monkey was walking one day, and he met the lizard who stopped to say, listen, my friend, come to my house and eat. I promise I'll fix you a very special treat. With delight, the monkey said, so when will this be? And in candy, the lizard said, tomorrow I'm free. The lizard hurried home to tell his wife, because they'd never fed a monkey in their entire life. The lizard said, monkeys think corn is good food. His wife said, if I told you what I think, you'd say that I'm rude. The lizard said, I'm off to see our chief, for I'm sure he'll agree to make our friend the monkey part of our family. When the monkey arrived the next day to dine, everything was prepared, especially fine. The chair, the table, everything was set. If only the chief's rules could be easily met. The monkey sat happily ready to eat the corn prepared especially as a tasty treat. The lizard said, friend, I'm sure you'll agree. Good friends are just part of one big family. My chief says you can become one of us. Just make your face white like mine without too much fuss. So the monkey washed and he washed and he scrubbed his face sore. But alas, he was just as black as before. Now my friends, it's very obvious to see that God's been very busy creating you and me. The question is, do we belong to one big family? As Kid Reza began to write, his approach was dry and academic, for that was what he knew from the seminary. His collection was a value for new European priests assigned to the island, but hardly suitable for children. Father Samard suggested that Kid Reza write a story, for then children would be interested. In 1945, Kitareza completed his novel, written in two parts. The first, Buona Mionbukeri na Bibi Buganoka, tells of Mionbukeri and his wife, Buganoka, who are unable to have children. This cultural curse is cause for Mionbukeri to seek another wife. How they, as a couple, resist family pressures to remain together is their story, weaving themes of curses and blessings, men and women, health and illness, war and peace. The second part, Untulanalwo Nabuliwali, Mionbukeri and Buganoka's children, continues the tale as their family struggles with the central arrival ish survival issues of production and reproduction. This story so impressed Father Samard, he had it typed, all 350 typewritten single-spaced pages. Father Samard approached a publisher in East Africa so that it could be used in primary schools. But this was in the early 1950s. And given the limited readership in Kikurebe, Kitareza's manuscript was rejected. Kitareza was 49 years old. During the ensuing years, Kitareza's name became familiar to islanders and also outside researchers as a rare ethnographer, a collector of oral traditions. As interested people came to his door promising publication, two of the typewritten copies vanished. By 1968, only one copy remained. Father Van Der Wee, who continued to mentor Kitareza following Father Samard's death, placed the final copy under lock and key in the seminary on the mainland. Kitareza was 72 years old. And now a translation epic. A doctoral student in African studies at Indiana University had read about Ukarewe's unusual oral traditions connected to long distance trade. In 1968, African studies was a newly admitted focus of study in higher education. Although significant research had been written, the gap of knowledge between documented history and oral tradition was significant. This gap intrigued the researcher. His dissertation would explore how critical oral traditions were to the interpretation of researched historical events. 
Jerry Hart was not a newcomer to Tanzania, as he had taught at Ilboro Secondary School near Arusha from 1961 to 1964. And with his wife Shuni and three children, Christopher, Carl, and Kari, the Hartwig family had already learned other ways of knowing and being, and they were eager to discover more on Ukarewe. Arriving on the island in the spring of 1968, Kitarese's name was one of the first given as a key informant. Hartwig's first visits were part of a process that became very familiar with all his informants. No Karebe would volunteer any information to an outsider, and certainly not to a white man, without first knowing who he was, where he came from, and what he was doing, and why. It took several weeks to develop trust, weeks of repeated visits with Chai and Ugali punctuating conversations. And then came the invitation from Kitareza to Hartwig to bring his family. It isn't enough to know a man and what he does. His family is his lifeblood, his future, his most valued possession. It was natural then that Kitareza's warm hospitality would be extended to include all in the Hartwig family. As they approached Kitareza's home, they called Hody, Hody, anyone home, as is the custom to announce one's arrival. From inside his mud and wattle home, a deep resonant voice responded, Karibu, Karibu. And in a few moments, Kitareza stood framed in the doorway, an aging man of medium build, his balding head circled with a fringe of gray. Clad in a red turtleneck sweater and khaki pants, he slowly emerged with the help of a walking stick. It was hard to ignore his swollen and misshapen feet and hands, for walking was clearly painful. Yet one look at his, this man's face and his physical difficulties were forgotten. Warmth, friendliness, and patience creased his smile as he welcomed each of us with a firm handshake. Easing himself into a chair near his wife, Anna, an aura of dignity permeated this clean-swept courtyard shaded by mango and lemon trees. It almost seemed as if Kitareza were holding court. The now erect posture as he viewed his guests made it obvious that this was a man who knew where he came from and that he took great pride in his origins. Anna, his wife, said very little. A small, frail woman, she quietly added smiles and nods to the conversation. This was the woman who had been Kitareza's only wife the woman who had borne four children and had suffered as each of them died before the age of four. Kitareza had left schooling and seminary to marry her. Anna had left her family on the mainland, 100 miles away, to marry him. Unlike the other compounds, where many houses are close together so that parents, grandparents, and children intermingle constantly in all their daily activities, Anna and Kitareza's house stood alone there was no chatter of voices around them. Their humble, thatched roofed homes stood isolate. In their old age, they were experiencing unspeakable loneliness. With no children to care for them, they were completely dependent upon one another. Together, as they were able, they cultivated rice, cassava, and beans. But Anna suffered from a heart condition, sapping her energy and limiting her activity. Their food came from what they could grow. They grew what their energies allowed them to plant. If the rains were good, they could eke out enough to survive, but it was a day-to-day -day survival. In spite of Kitareza's education and his many abilities, his life showed no evidence of any financial rewards. As the conversation turned to Kitareza's writing, his expression darkened as a cloud before a storm. Scorn and disappointment accented Kitareza's voice as he began to relate the sad story of his novel, and in particular, the ethnographer seeking him out, promising publication, as they took his manuscript. I now have a new proverb, he said. When the Europeans came, they treated us like monkeys and took everything from us that they wanted. But then, as Kitareza began to talk about the novel itself, the sun came out as he described the characters, the theme of the story, and how he used Karebe folktales and proverbs. His words suddenly ceased to be mere sentences. It was poetic speech, full of an almost parental concern and hope. For 23 years, they had waited to see his cherished words in print. For 23 years, they had faith and hope that each tomorrow might bring the book to publication. When Hartwig asked Kitareza to tell us about his reading, this is writing, this is what he said. I finished writing this book on February 13, 1945, 
a book I wrote out of my deeply felt desire to preserve the customs and the way of life of our ancestors. Fearing this great way of life of our ancestors and the principles that govern them would one day disappear and be completely forgotten, I felt I had to write them down, otherwise future generations of our people would lose their rightful heritage of the customs and traditions of their ancestors. The prospect of such a loss filled me with great pity for the generations of our people to come. And so I looked for the best way of telling them how their ancestors lived. That's why I decided to re write this story. It was obvious to me that writing this book in a story would make people want to read the book more. But above all, I wanted this to be a way of preserving the language of our ancestors by showing the reader how beautifully they spoke to each other, whether it was in their neighborly conversations, during palavers in each other's homes, or simply in the casual exchange of greetings between even total strangers who chanced to meet on the roads, who too would always politely exchange with each other greetings and news of wherever they were coming from and inform each other of where they were going. This country would be lost for our children and the children not yet born if they were not written down. For how else will they be preserved? I selected a method. It would be best to put these words in a book. And I wrote in Kikrebe so that the customs of our fathers would be known in this place of Bukrebe. And so considering, concerning these matters, I began carefully to search for those secrets of long ago those things loved and those things despised. And after I began to fully understand, I realized that the most despised person was one unable to have children, whether a man or a woman. Such a person, Ngumba, was greatly ridiculed by those whose fortune was good, those who were able to bear children. Can life have meaning without children? There's not a man who is able to say, as for me, I do not have death in my body, if he does, he is a fool. One day, a man may have wealth, strength in body, and joy in heart, but tomorrow it may all vanish, leaving grief beyond measure. Misfortune comes with no warning. It can occur in the morning, at any time. These things are the power of God. To hide a disease is to want it revealed by mourners. When Kita Reza spoke these words, he had been waiting 23 years for his novel to be published. And now the tale of his waiting is another epic within an epic. When the Hartwigs left Kita Reza and Anna after that first meeting, they knew that they had been in the presence of an extraordinary man. Before saying their quaheris, two promises were made. First, Hartwig would take the ferry to Mwanza on the mainland to secure the one remaining copy of Kita Reza's manuscript, kept at the Catholic mission. Second, he would seek possible publishers. Not unlike any road trip in Tanzania, this extraordinary publishing safari would be fraught with potholes, diversions, and tire blowouts. Perseverance and good faith would be required over what at times seemed an endless journey of 11 years. Once the one remaining copy was secured from the Catholic mission in Mwanza, copies of the first section were sent to the Institute of Kiswahili in Dar es Salaam. Their response was immediate. The readership of Kikarebe was too small to warrant publishing. Before further consideration, he would need to translate his book from Kikarebe to Kiswahili. Kitareza set up his office under the shade of the mango tree with two orange crates for his desk to begin the laborious task of meticulously translating the first chapters. It was now early June, nearing the end of the rainy season. Damp cold meant necessary retreats into their humble home bereft of good light. And too many roof leaks. His gnarled fingers and swollen hands would have sufficed as a deterrent to this gargantuan task. Not Kitareza. Over the next eight months, the Hartwig family made frequent visits to Kitareza's home, bringing tablets and pens to keep the translating author well supplied. On one occasion, they brought a visiting friend from Boston, Massachusetts, <clears throat> a meeting that would be life-changing for Emily Larson and for Anna Setti. This middle-aged spinster, this Bostonian proper woman, met the Hartwigs during their Harvard days as they attended the same Lutheran church. She often wore white gloves, always modest in attire and always striding in sturdy shoes. 
a prim and proper middle-aged woman, her bent forward posture encompassed a woman with a passion for student learning. As a junior high counselor, her devotion to them was clear, but Boston understated. When Emily learned of the Hartwig's research time on Ukurewe, she asked if she might visit along with her nephew David. Of all the possible visitors, she was not on their list. They simply couldn't imagine how she would manage the daunting Arusha Mwanza road trip to say nothing of island living. Their concerns were for naught. Before the Kitareza visit, she listened attentively to the details of his life, his writing, and the Hartwig's commission, commitment to publish his book. But first, he needed to translate the Kikurebe to Kiswahili before it could be considered for publication. Emily was well acquainted with those who publish. Her three aunts each earned their doctorates, each published significantly in biology, economics, and history. Emily was embarked upon her own writing project focused on middle school learners. When Larson and Kitareza met, it was one of kindred spirits. Emily not only had suggestions, but she acted on them. Might the Journal of Natural History be interested in an article? She would make the initial contacts. And what of Kitareza's continuing need for papers, pens, and postage? How might she assist? Might Ben Gay ointment help his increasing rheumatic pain? After a three-day stay on Ukarewe, Emily returned to Boston to middle school student counseling and pursuit of a natural history commitment. She also initiated a monthly $10 check to support Kitareza, as well as ointments for his rheumatism. When the Hartwigs returned to graduate school in Bloomington, Indiana, Jerry hand-carried his dissertation notes, Shuni hand-carried Kitareza's first chapter translations. Emily's query letter to natural history bore fruit. The Hartwigs submitted an article that included an excerpt from Kitareza's novel, How Men and Women Came to Live Together. It was published in 1970. Because natural history pays contributors by the column, Kitareza received funds to replace his leaking thatch roof for rain-resistant body. This same year, in the journal Research in African Literature, the Hartwigs published an article focused on Kitareza. With this quick, this quick publishing response, giving initial exposure to Kitareza's writing, hopes for successful publishing in Tanzania seem probable. In October 1970, the research in Swahili Institute in Dar es Salaam received the first translated chapter. Their response was devastating. Kitareza's Swahili was old-fashioned. It did not comply with their guidelines. Therefore, they could not consider it for publication. This refusal, daunting as it was, did not deter Jerry Hartwig. The next contact would be to Heinemann's in Nairobi. Their head office in London and East African office in Kenya had launched the African Writers Series in 1962. The names of Achebe, Kaunda, Samkangi, and many others became known first in African universities and gradually in the US and Europe. These writers wrote in English. Their novel, novels intentionally addressed post-colonial themes. Kitareza didn't fit the established mode, but might they consider his significant contribution to African literature? Hartwig sent the first pages of Kitareza's translation with an introductory background to Heinemann's senior editor. He, in turn, sent it on to their Kiswahili editor, John Allen, living in Arusha, Tanzania. Allen's response was so positive, he envisioned this novel to be a unique contribution to African literature. How soon could the author provide a translation of all 350 typewritten pages? Under the mango tree, in his compound, Anu Kurewe, in the village of Muru Tunguru, Kitareza laboriously continued the translation of his entire novel into Kiswahili. The promise that his words first spoken would be written as a legacy to the next generation moved his gnarled hands to write. No one could have imagined how long it would take before Kitareza's words would be birthed to live in print. Nor could anyone have anticipated the many key people who would communicate through letters with one goal in mind, publish Kitareza's book. This significant collection of letters is an epic publishing story. Until these letters began, Kita Reza had never written on a blue aerogram, never exchanged letters with anyone outside of the Karebe world. These are the primary correspondence, 
Anna Sadikita Reza, Murutunguru, Ukarewe, Tanzania. Jerry Hartwig, Duke University, Durham, North Carolina. Robert Markham, Heinemans, Nairobi, Kenya. John Allen, translator, Arusha, Tanzania. Emily Larson, friend, Boston, Massachusetts. Catholic Fathers, Murutunguru, Ukurewe. Their letters span the years between 1969 and 1980, during which 214 letters were written. 87 are Kitarese's aerograms, translated from Swahili to English. This extraordinary epistolary epic captures the spirit, the space, and the heart of all contributors. Now, within the book, I have many letters, the majority of them. You'll only hear a few to give you the idea. February 8, 1969, Larson to Kitarese. Dear Mr. Kitarese, I thank you for your beautiful letter. Indeed, I shall never forget our hour with you in the afternoon sun talking of many things. David and I recall our three days on Ukurewe as a high point in our lives. I cannot tell you how pleased I am that you are translating your book into Swahili. What you are writing about Ukurewe will be lost unless you put it down. To put thoughts on paper is very hard work. It's so wonderful that you translate it yourself so that you retain the meaning of the words and thought and the poetry of your language. I have sent more money to the Hartwigs for you and I shall send medicine with directions. There are not many medicines for <coughs> rheumatism, but I will do my best. To keep warm and dry is very important. Writing is laborious, the hardest work I do, but do not give up hope. If the warm sun has come, you may feel better. And what you are doing is so important. Sincerely, Emily Larson. July 15th, 1969, Kitareza to English. Miss Emily Larson, thank you very much for your letter of June 26th, which I received on July 9th, 1969. I am also very thankful for your marvelous gift of $10, the equivalent of 70 shillings. I'm also very grateful for the saving medication that you sent to me. When I opened your letter, I was terribly thrilled and highly excited, longing to hear what you were going to say. My wife was also very anxious to hear what you had written. Thank you ever so much for having remembered me at my moment of need. I pray God to preserve you for many more years to come. God's blessings to you. February 9th, 1970, Kitareza to Hartwig. Miss Emily Larson sent me a picture from Natural History, so now he's seen the evidence of his work. I was very happy to see my words in print. There is a picture of Juana and Mama Hartwig, but underneath your picture it says Charlotte Hartwig, and then he's written in caps, who is that? <laughs> Since he doesn't know that Charlotte is my legal name. My picture with me seated at my poor table made me very happy, and when I called Anna Katura, she too was very excited. You have written about my life, Mr. G. J. Hartwig, and it's well done, A.K. 24th September 1970, Kitareza to Hartwig. Dear Jerry, you've asked me how I am doing with the writing translation. I've had health problems, first with diarrhea for some time, also because of my rheumatism. If I sit at my desk for even a short time, my le legs begin to swell, but I try as I can to continue the translation. Thank you for the money sent. Anima Katura, my wife, sends her greetings. We are happy that Mrs. Shuni birthed a baby. Kurt is what sex. May God be with all of you. <laughs> Yours, AK. 20th May, 1971, Markham to, Hi to Hartwig. Dr. Hartwig, many thanks for your recent letter with which you enclosed your proposed introduction to Anasetti's Kitareza's novel, which you have prepared for research in African literatures. I still have the same sad story to tell you regarding the fate of the two halves of Kitareza's Swahili work. The regional education officer in Mwanza has had the first half for the last three months and refuses to answer letters and to return the manuscript with his report. The Institute of Swahili Research in Dar es Salaam has had the second part for approximately the same length of time, and although they have acknowledged receipt and have stated that they are working on it, I can get no further information from them. I realize that Kitareza's health is gradually getting worse and I'm doing my personal best in trying to establish if this publishing house can possibly publish his Swahili work. I am certain that you will realize that an evaluation must come from a Tanzania source for such a work. 2nd June, 1971, Markham to Hartwig. Further to my letter of the 20th May, I have now heard from the Institute of Swahili Research 
in Dar es Salaam regarding part two of Anasetti's work, which was sent to them many months ago. I quote from their report. The Institute of Kiswahili has read critically the manuscript all through and felt that the theme running through it is interesting and makes an exciting reading. However, the language does not conform to the acceptable standard of Swahili in many respects, and this in general has spoiled the whole work. Because the construction mistakes have marred the whole book, it is extremely necessary to rewrite the whole story if you insist on publishing it. John Allen, that's the end of that quote, and then this editor in Nairobi continues to say, John Allen, who was and still tremendously keen, noted that the Swahili, and he quotes John Allen, is perhaps a trifle old-fashioned, but not too dated, end quote. The Institute says the Swahili does not conform to conflicting reports from recognized authorities. Publication is still the risk of the publisher, but the Institute's report is something of a deterrent to publishing as it is obvious that Anasetti cannot rewrite throughout. And so the publishing saga continues until 1974. An announcement comes from Heinemann's in Nairobi. It is with desperation and the greatest reluctance that I have to announce the decision of my company not to progress with the publication of the above work. This decision includes the work in English, in its original Swahili, and in any form of Swahili. Many factors come into this, and I will try to list them as they all influence the decision made my, by my fellow directors. Once again, Jerry Hartwig moves forward, and he con contact, contacts someone at the Ford Foundation in Nairobi. But the letters continue. 3rd August 1974, this is one of the fathers, the Catholic fathers, Anu Kurewe, who writes to Emily Larson. Dear Miss Emily, when I was in bed last night and closing myself in the blankets, I was thinking and asking myself how Anasetti would feel. I visited him yesterday and found him in a most miserable situation. As you know, the people have to move to new houses in villages, but they have anticipated the date by two weeks. So many people are not yet ready to build, but had to move anyhow. So did Kita Reza. As he can't walk, they moved him and his belongings in a Land Rover to the place where they were building his new house. The only thing of this house I can say is that there is a roof on it, no floor, just sand, no walls, just some poles connected with bamboo. On all the four sides, it was practically open. In order to hide himself a little from the cold, he or other people had pinned up some hessian cloth. No door yet in the house, no toilet, no place where to wash. It was a real mess. Everything on the floor, no table. Moreover, there would be not a place for a table, just a bed and a chair. And if I say it's a mess, then it is a mess. Unbelievable. But I found him in a good mood. Well, I know thousands of people are in the same circumstance as he, but by far, most of them can help themselves. But he has no children, neither family. So everything has to be done by other people who have to be paid. He had some people working for him, but they ran away so they could gain more money. 14th September, Kita Reza to Hartwig. I understand that you haven't heard from John Allen, nor I. He should have the glossary for the translation of the two parts, so I hope he has finished it all. I was happy to read that your book will be published. Really, Mr. Jerry, this is the first time our history has been done. As for my new house, it is very expensive from the roof to nails and other materials. Imagine everyone in Tanzania having to move to a new place. This is a great problem along with illness and old age. On the 27th of August, Father Van Der Wee came to testify that we will all be in a Kanganguli center. Let us pray. 10th of April. Kitareza to Larson. When Father Mate visited me on 18th April, he asked if you had assisted me, and I replied that I had not heard much news from you. He was surprised and said that perhaps the Post had lost the letter, so I will write about this to them as well. And then on the 21st of February 1975, Kitareza writes to Larson. Mr. John Allen and his wife, Winifred, visited me with news of the Swahili edition of my book. They stayed three days and slept at the Murutunguru Parish, returning to Nairobi, Kenya. Here in Kaganguli Center, I have been so very ill, near death. It began first March, a high fever. I couldn't walk or sleep. My body refused to leave my bed to go outside. 
My wife tried to help me and prayed to God until we got outside. Then I began to vomit and I fell down right on my face. When we got back into our house, my f fever continued to take all my strength. Since that time, someone came to stay here for three days. I couldn't eat anything, but I drank water and Coca-Cola. My legs are very swollen, as well as a family member asked a doctor to come and he gave me shots of penicillin, for which I paid 30 shillings. Now my leg is better, but I have not been able to walk. Your friend, Anaceti Kitareza. 21st June, Kitareza to Hartwig. Dear G.J. Hartwig, I remember that I know you and Mama Hartwig have a great deal of work, but now I'm asking, do you have any news of publishing my book? Where is it these days? Please answer me soon about the English translation also. On 17th June, 1975, I welcomed guests from the Tanzanian government here at my house in Kagunguli Center. They came from Dar es Salaam. They told me that they have seen my tra Swahili translation, which came from the Ford Foundation in Nairobi, brought there by John Allen. The representatives from Tanzania came from the literature department at the university and said they were happy to receive a copy and want to publish it soon. They would like to see the original translation, but when they required at Nairobi, they to were told that John Allen went to Europe, so they came to my home. Rheumatism continues to bother me morning to night. Your friend, Anaceti. 7th July, 1975, Hartwig to Kedereza. Dear Anaceti, I've received your letter of June 21st and I'm delighted to learn that you have been visited by friends from the, and representatives from the University of Dar es Salaam. There is no news about the English translation of Myombakeri and Buganoka. It was sent to Khartoum, Sudan to see if the university press would be interested, but I fear that's not going to work either. And now I'm not, I, I am unsure whether I should try another press. I have not heard from John Allen since last September, and at the present time, I don't have his address, but will write to him as soon as I can. July 16th, 1975, John Allen to Hartwig. In my letter of 10th July, I grossly maligned the Tanzanian publishing house. I have a telegram from them reading, quote, definitely publishing Kitareza in Kiswahili and English. Letter follows fortnight today, Bogoya. I think at last we can rest. I think that I can now congratulate you because it was your efforts that started the whole thing. Without you, I should never have heard of Anaceti. I have no idea how long it will take now before we actually see the book in print. I hope that we will all live to see it. 18th July, 1975, Hartwig to Allen. I have waited a few days before responding to your letter indicating that Kitareza is to be published in Swahili and English. For some reason, skepticism remains, although you definitely exuded optimism. I only hope that you're right. This <coughs> manuscript has been on my conscience for eight years, on your mind for what, five? And then there is Anaceti. This marks the 30th year since it was completed. Oh me, apparently the Ford Foundation has stayed committed. Your part in this saga has been monumental. Well done. 13th April, 1978. Key to raise it to Hartwigs. News of my book, Myombakeri, I received a copy of part one on 29th March, 1978, and I have begun editing for ten mistakes. The Tanzanian Publishing House says they hope to complete it by September, 1978, and then the second part in 1979. 4th August, 1979, Key to raise to Larson. I have news that John Allen died on 6th April 1979 at his home in Oxford. 28th October 1979, still from Kitareza to Larson. I received a letter from Winifreda, wife of John Allen, to tell me of his death. We knew him so very well and together we worked on the translation of my book, Myombakeri. 24th December 1979, Kitareza to Larson, bad news. Here in my house, my wife, Anna Katura, is very ill. They took her to the Kagunguli Hospital. She can hardly breathe. Her heart beats so fast that she doesn't know anything. I am so f sad, I do not know if she's able to recover. Please send this news to Gerald Jerry Hartwig and his wife, Shuni. And then 1980, 29th of February, Kitareza to Hartwig. Anna Katura has left this world. She left me here all alone. On 7th February, she died after three months of illness. I am late in writing, but I couldn't because of my deep sorrow. 
26 June 1980, Kid Reza to Hartwigs. Dear, dear, both friends, Mrs. and Mr. Gerald Jerry Hartwig, as I received your best letter of May 1980, so I have seen and think this letter is the words of condolence on the, wife, on the death of my very beloved wife, Anna Katura. Please forgive my broken English, which I'm going for to write it now to answer your best letter, which you have sent me on 9th May 1980. Yes, dear Mrs. and Mr. Gerald Jerry Hartwig, I remember the day you first came to my home with your children. And in the, I also remember the time of your historical research. Thank you very much to give me unchangeable, constant, and reminiscent of mine and Anna's faithful devotion to one another over many years from our youth to old age. I have understood now that in Anna's death, I share the bond of our Lord, and this is truly Anna has given me a gift of living that I shall also always remember. 14th January 1981, Kitareza to Larson. I was very sad to read of Jerry's death. You said he died on a Sunday, the 19th of October, sitting in a chair near his daughter, and he had heart sickness, but he died suddenly. I profess this from my heart. All men on this earth will one day die. Those left behind, the living, we pray to the Spirit of God to receive them and a long life in heaven. Amen. Also, I know that Jerry's wife, Shuni, suffers great sorrow. She's left behind, like me. Truly, she has had great troubles. Indeed, it is the way of this world. I will be writing her a condolence. And then, an announcement of Anasetti's death on the 6th of September, 1981. And Father Van Der Wee writes about his death, and he says, a gifted person for sure, spiritually and intellectually. He was a catechist for many years, working with the parish priest, Father Simard writing dictionaries, translating the New Testament. He was my Kikurebe teacher. He was always kind, helpful, witty, always smiling, a deep faith, being faithful to his marriage, though he had no children. Intelligent, knew good German, yes, an outstanding man, a good influence on all who had the opportunity to, to know him. Kitareza was 85 years old. So ends this remarkable exchange of more than 200 letters. Over these 11 years, the correspondent's primary focus has been to publish Kitareza's novel. However, what we learn about his lived Ukarewe world, as well as the, those writing it, reveals the very personal kinship that developed between all. It's a prelude to the continuing publishing epic. Two weeks after Kitareza's death, two copies of Myombakere arrived in the Nancio post office. Although he had received the copy edition for editing, he never held the final Kiswahili publication. In 1985, a book review entitled An Extraordinary Novel Out of Africa appeared in Development Novel, Dialogue. The author, M. M. Mulukozi, writes this, and I quote, Throughout his many years, Kitareza has had more than his rightful share of life's tragedies. In many ways, the tragic streak of his life is paralleled in the lives of his major characters. Buana Myombakeri and his wife, Bibi Bugunoka, they, like Kitareza, are obsessed with a desire for offspring. Thus begins the story of the adventures of this unhappy Karebe family, who is supposed to have lived sometime in the 17th or 18th century. It revolves around the twin poles of production and reproduction, creation and procreation. Through production within the framework of his clan, his village, his kingdom, and the accompaniment and the accompanying traditions, beliefs, customs, and taboos, Karebe man produces wealth in order to build his eka, or household, and hence realize his humanity and his ma manhood. This he cannot achieve by interacting and cooperating with his fellow humans. This he can achieve by interacting and cooperating with his fellow humans, obeying the common law, and not daring to go beyond the limits sanctioned by society in whatever he does. The purpose of labor is to build the eka. The purpose of marriage is to consolidate that eka by supplying it with offspring who will both protect and perpetuate the eka, and through the eka, the clan, and ultimately the species. Hence the need for interaction and exchange, both human and material, between different eka, different clans. And this is where the central problem of the story lies. For Mionburkere and Buganoka fail to have children, Without children, what basis is there for him and Buganoka to remain united in marriage? 
Can love alone sustain marriage in a society where offspring come before anything else, where barrenness is a social stigma? More seriously, can Myomba Carey and Buganoka build their Eka without offspring? How and what for? Can life have meaning without children? This novel is, in short, a mine of ethnographical, historical, and scientific information about pre-colonial Bacarebe and its people. Yet it is not history, nor is it, strictly speaking, a historical novel. All the characters are imaginary, all the incidents fictitious. There is no mention of the reigning kings, nor any appraisal of their historically known actions. There is very little about the political feuds and upheavals that characterize the Carebe Kingdom in the 18th and 19th centuries. All this is beyond Kitarese's intentions. His, pri his primary objective is to preserve the language, customs, practices, and cultural traditions of the Bakarebe, seen from the point of view of the ordinary 19th century Karebe, for the benefit of future generations. Mibwana Miyombukeri na Bibi Bugunoka na Untulanalwo na Buliwali is primarily and deliberately a cultural novel. This work remains a classic of Swahili literature. It is the longest Swahili novel ever published, the most racy, and the richest cult culturally. Without question, it establishes Kitareza as a le leading Swahili, nay, African novelist, and the first and last of his kind. Buana Mionbekeri na Bibi Bugunoka is not only Kitareza's masterpiece, it is his Eka. For without offspring, he has, in the Karebe view, no Eka. His Eka is this book in which he placed all his talent and aspirations. It is his only child and his only wealth. At the time of his death, he was a very poor man living in a one-room hut built for him by the Kagunguli Ujamaa villagers. His greatest desire, as he admitted to the present author, was to see his book in print before his death." End quote. In 1985, the English translation of Kitarese's book was published by Mkuki Ya Niota Publishers in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Dr. Gabriel Ruhumbika and Umkarebe translated Miombakeri from its original Kikarebe text to English. And in his introduction, he states this, and I quote, Kitarese's novel is significant. For more than its content, it also adds to a new style of African literature. For Kitareza adopted an innovative storyteller style, rather than merely transcribing African oral stories or imitating traditional African lit, Kitareza used the old art form to create a new kind of work. He narrated his story like a traditional African storyteller, employing an array of oral tradition conventions to create a work that depicts better defined characters than conventional oral stories, and seeks to explore in depth human and social experiences. It is this innovative style, which more than anything else, makes his work both an important African contribution to world lit and a milestone in the growth of modern African literature. Ruhumbika then quotes Hartwig, who says, to seek and find and then share the secrets of life in a bygone era, to discover those things loved and those things despised became Kitareza's goal enabling him to write a story of universal significance because it concerns common people, those whose daily unglorified existence and beliefs must be respected because they are ours." End quote. Since Miombakeri's English translation, it is now available in German and French. Kitareza's Eka lives on beyond the isolated shores of Ukarewe in Lake Victoria. It lives on beyond its first language of Kikarebe. It lives on because his particular response to what should we teach our children is universal. Anasetti Kitareza is the world's extraordinary ex epic. Thank you. So I have copies up here. I don't know if you want them passed around. Carefully. This one Does has a, a very special uh, note to Shuni from Ruhimbika, so be very careful. It's a and this is the Swahili edition. This is a copy of an aerogram, and you'll see the meticulous way of writing of Anasetti himself. To say nothing of the translation on the pages 876 of these, 
that he did to complete the translation from Kikarebe to Kiswahili. Just gives you a little bit of an idea. Thank you so much. Lots of stories within stories yes. within stories. Lots of biographical um, narratives going on. We have time for questions. Um, we pass the microphone not because it amplifies the voice, but because it makes your voice heard on the live stream. So if anybody has a question, Shinryo. Oh, yeah. Are I'm you, are you gonna, are you gonna? I was just gonna go around. Okay. Yeah, please do, thank you. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it. And it's the, I guess the tenacity of this Arthur and how dedicated he was to write this epic tale. I really want to read it now, so thank you so much for that. So my question is, what happened to the legacy of the book after he passed away? Um, I know that he didn't have any offspring. Um, however, he, he seemed to be a person who was highly um, into educating the next generation. So I guess I want to know, were there any resources given to Tanzania? Uh, were there any uh, programs created in the legacy of? Uh, how did this book kind of, uh, without his physical presence, continue to manifest his own ideals? Good question, because as those who have published know, depending on what it is you're publishing, the readership might be very small, even though it's very important to you who wrote it. And Mion Bakari is a tome, um, and it is used in Tanzania, but not a lot. This is a country that does not um, have a heritage of reading, especially in English, easily, other than to pass the examinations that get you from one stage of education to another. And actually, your question is why I wrote the book. Because this, will, this is 187 pages long, and it could get edited down. Not by much, hopefully, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it, it would be a way for others to get in more easily to the life of this extraordinary man. I don't know about you, but I have, I mean, I, I'm older than, I'm the MZ in this room, but um, the old woman in the group. Um, but I have never heard of anyone like an anesthetic he raise. He needs to be known more than just in a classroom. So would a small biography be a way to engage people initially to get into his writing? But you should also know that there is going to be an effort here um, at MSU to start in the, one of the Pan-African alliances, however you call that, to look into the many ways that his work could be used. Um, the, 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 the stature of this man, there's simply, I don't have enough words to say it. I mean, I tried, but it's, it's really impossible. Um, within the letters you didn't hear, um, he suffered greatly physically. And so that in places in rural Tanzania is hard. And that coupled in parallel with suffering for the lack of getting his book published. So anything that I can do from now on and with a biography and uh, moving this in Tanzania, but also here, because I believe it has a story to tell and hopefully gives all you young ones some energy to write and put down stories and pre do whatever it is you're doing to preserve the ways that might, as Kitareza, Kitareza would say, be um, lost if you don't write. He had this saying that he loved to, to repeat many times, words that are spoken fly like the wind, but words that are written live forever. Are there any surviving copies of the novel in Kikarewa? Uh, the surviving copies, um, this, the copy that I have, I have the uh, one of the surviving copies. Mm -hmm. How many others there are, I do not know. And that one of the discussions we'll be having is where the they reside. Do they go to Tanzania? Um, along, the, I mean, the blue aerograms are also of great historical mm -hmm. significance. So, in what space space should they be? So, um, because the translation went to so many different people, 
Um, so John Hall Allen had some of them. The the um, when Jerry made the contact to Ford in, Ford, uh, uh, the, I mean the Ford Foundation had had them. So was, to my knowledge, I uh, Bika would have mm -hmm. something, but he had the original Kikarebe text. Yeah, so, that's what I'm wondering about. Yeah. Was that ever, so it, was ne no, it never it was never published. No, no, that could never see the light of day because kids would not be reading it. I mean, it's not a reading culture. So there was nobody that was going to publish it. I, I, uh, Ruhumbika would know, but beyond that, I don't know about the Kikurebe. Um, so, so then a related question to Anne's question. Um, you know, is, is this story remembered, still discussed in Ukurebe? Is it remembered? Like, I mean, you talk about the sort of larger Tanzanian. Yeah. Um, I think it's part of the lore. I can't really speak to it. I haven't been there since 1970. That's a lot, a long time ago now. And lo and you know, you ask. I, I mean, if I were to ask your generation what's going on wherever it is you live, it'd be very different from what I would say. So, um, I, I really can't answer that. I do not believe that he is well known at all. Um, only really at the university level is my guess. And unless and. There are some family members left um, because they had to search through that um, because of of the aspect of getting the book book published and who's going to get the the money. So, um, but it's he he is not well known. Um, earlier in your in your piece, you discussed the trend of um, early African writers and really kind of writing um, towards um, emphasizing the betterment of mm -hmm. of of the Europeans coming mm -hmm. to Africa and what have you. Was there any barriers or uh, barriers to having this published because of the material hmm. at all uh, or, or, or no? I, I don't believe so. Uh, because he was, he was not, um, he was not beating the, the drum that African Writers series did, especially the West African Writers. So there would be no reticence of that. Um, what's interesting is that the, the real hiccup in it was his key Swahili. And, and that's from his own countrymen. And it came at a time when the judgment of the use of Swahili, so you know, make a marvelous PhD thesis, it seems to me, in my opinion, so to, to look at that Swahili. And that's what this is. I mean, that piece that's been around. Um, that's his Swahili of outdated. So um, it, it's, 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 it's a phenomenon unto itself. But no, I don't think that uh, that was. Uh, the, the problem, as you can probably imagine, if you're uh, Bob Markham sitting um, in Heinemann's in Nairobi and taking this up, I mean, they'd never taken up a book like this, and willing to do that for five years, um, believed in it enough. So the, the sensibility of the possibility seemed to be great enough. So then you have this John Allen, who is an Oxford person, who is a staunch supporter and carried it on. And, um, and then having to you know, move to the Ford Foundation from Heinemann's, um, and then finally, Tanzanian Publishing Company. So we're dreaming maybe that the, that when the this uh, that it would be joint publishing for his biography between MSU Press and Tanzania Press, which would really be perfect, and um, really bring that partner that that collaboration together at a time when and also working with Matrix and other the digital world. Uh, there's so many possibilities of of sharing. But the question still is, um, where do I leave all of the primary documents? And I'm very, I, I, you know, I don't want to have my own epistolary saga to say, you know, in 10 years, <laughs> 10 years she's waiting for somebody to figure out what to do with it. Hopefully that will be decided very soon, and I can hand that over. Yeah, so I'm from Burundi. I do speak Swahili even. But uh, the question is like, because I came late, I don't know the key point of this time. Thank you. The key point is what? Yeah, the key point of meeting of this, because I will be uh, Dr. Choti from his class, and so he gives us like a, a list of events 
and I send also uh, he sent me here to so to attend this event. So I don't know what the point of this event. Aha. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. It's wonderful that you're here. And we have others here that have just come for the first time maybe to Ion Africa. So it's a great opportunity starting the year to let everybody know what we do. We have every Thursday at noon a, a speaker, a guest to share something about their research, some from far away, some from our community, and a chance to ask questions. But this is not the tea time, and so I can give a little advertisement for the tea time, which is on Thursdays, every other Thursday. And that's more of a get together, especially for our students, people from our African community to talk about their life experiences, their homes. It's, it's time for people to build community and get to know each other. Mm -hmm. So we hope all of you, if you come to our events, keep coming. And if it's your first time, uh, we have some flyers. Um, and uh, before we finish, I'll be giving you um, some information about the next upcoming uh, events. Any other? questions about the talk or content? Yeah. So, so you. And then we'll close with the last question. All right, sounds good. Uh, I guess my question uh, ties into the last sort of stream of questions, which is, is there any such forums as we had today that will be happening in, in Tanzania as mm -hmm. well? Just because I feel like this just has brought so much intrigue to people who previously didn't know who mm -hmm. Kit Teresa was. And if we're talking about the fact that it's not that well known mm -hmm. in Tanzania as well, I mm -hmm. don't know if it's you or if somebody else, if there's, if there's this sort of conversations happening, especially in light of your, of your book. Um, yes, uh, very important. And here and there. And, um, I mean, I think that the importance for those who are studying global, many different interest areas um, I th in my opinion, a lot of, re of, of wor global literature needs to be rewritten. Um, there needs to be African history in this I idea of literature needs to be rewritten. Um, folklore needs to have a new interpretation because of this. So I, at this point, you're the first place I've gone. <laughs> I have no idea um, what will happen in the process of of expanding the, the first-hand connection. I will be probably in Tanzania next May, um, but, uh, and, but I'm not going because of the book. I'm going for the, the partnership that I work with. And um, Rusha is not that far from Dar es Salaam. So if things are moving here and there is a you know, request to meet people, that would be a time to do that for initial connections. But I think a lot will be forthcoming. That's my sense that this, this becomes a catalyst for new conversations, new leadership, new, new th um, research, and new partnerships. Well, thank you so much. Thanks to everyone for coming. Um, thank you so much, Shuni, for, thank you. for paying us this visit, telling us about your project. And we're delighted to have been the first uh, <laughs> forum to start sharing um, what you're hoping to do.